audience. We're thrilled to see you here, and I want to thank you all for being here, as well as I know we have a large audience that is also watching this online. So this is the third and final event in our Talking Timber lecture series, inspired by our exhibit, Reframed, the Future of Cities in Wood. That is directly behind us. If you haven't been yet, please go and see it. It will be running until the end of the year. So our first event looked broadly at mass timbers characteristics as a building material, essentially explaining what it was used and how it is used and its sustainable attributes. And our second event examined mass timbers prospects in Chicago, the various building code challenges, and how this material is being used throughout the country. So tonight, we'll be surveying a number of ambitious projects, nationally and internationally, that point to a major scaling up of timber projects in cities. Our partnership with the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat and lead sponsor, the Softwood Lumber Board, helped make both the exhibit and this lecture series possible. We're going to close the series on a hopeful and optimistic note and leave you with a vision for sustainable, low-carbon urban development with the help of several of these top practitioners in mass timber design and engineering. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to CAC's program partner and tonight's moderator, my partner in crime who made this all happen, Javier Quintana, CEO of the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat. Thank you, Eleanor. They just told me that the monitor is not working, so I guess we're going to have to present uh, from here. That's fine. Um, well, good evening. Um, thanks all for being here. Thanks, Eleanor. Thanks to the team of the Chicago Architecture Center. But also, I, I want to thank you know, the, the team of the Council on Tall Buildings and Rural Habitat that have been working together with you guys. And of course, as Eleanor mentioned, all the sponsors involved, all the individuals, audience. Just to give you an idea, you're one of the 30,000 people that have passed through this room, you know, this space uh, in relationship uh, uh, with Reframe um, since April. I think it's a relevant number. I wanted to say we're here in a way to celebrate um, the second life of an old friend, an old material that is wood, um, that in an engineered and manufactured uh, version now called tall timber is breaking through many um, people, fields, and um, um, cities. You know? And we've made um, sure that um, with the representation of Big, big companies like the ones we have here, um, we could give you a new vision of what is happening and you know, deep knowledge of people you know, uh, that are uh, experts in the field. Um, timber has also made its way through the world of tall buildings, and that's why CTBUH is, is part of this. But not only as you know, extensions to existing buildings, um, but also uh, to more ambitious projects uh, like Ascent in Walking, and uh, we had the chance, you know, to talk about it during our first uh, 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 our first panel, no, uh, almost 300 feet. Um, what I like uh, about timber is that it's not only a new uh, new material; it's also a new situation. It's a new condition. It's a new opportunity to create, and this is what I would like you know to touch on um, tonight. As Eleanor said, today is the third part uh, after a reflection of you know basically the exhibit, and then a vision of what Chicago, a Chicago with uh, timber buildings, could look like. Today we want to be a bit more positive, a bit more uh, creative, and think about the vision of opportunities that the material is going to offer to all of us. Uh, we have, for the first time, an international representation. Thank you very much. We have people coming from Canada, all the way from, from Denmark. Christian, thank you very much. 
But as I said, you know, uh, just to see companies like KPF, like SOM, uh, like Dialogue, the ones that you've seen there, you know, uh, Studio Gang and Smith Hammer Latsen, I, I, I think it gives you an idea that the big players, the interesting companies, they all have projects in Timber on their desks, no? And, and that is what really uh, is about. There is something happening, you know, in hybrid form with a combination with steel, or concrete or just in pure version mass timber uh, in the design world that you know is giving opportunities for a new uh, new buildings. Um, well I don't want to talk more now. I just want to give you know the opportunity to our speakers uh, to be there and to speak. Yeah, um, I'm not going to introduce you as we agree. Please introduce yourself when you when you start, and then please give us the link that you have to the exhibit, please, so people can get um, you know a better idea of what's your connection to Refrain. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll see you later when we have you know questions and we we'll start conversation um, later. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. Um, all right, I hope you can hear me. I am Juliana Wolf. I'm a Let's see, let me advance this first of all. Um, I'm a design principal and partner at Studio Gang, here in, uh, located here in the Chicago office. And um, in the exhibition, we are showing a few of our higher educational projects that are uh, planned and uh, partially under construction to be out of timber, including um, the new building for the California College of the Arts, um, as well as Kresge College. Um, all right, and I am here on behalf of uh, Genie Gang and the founder of Studio Gang and um, the 130 of my amazing colleagues, a few of which are actually in the audience, I'm just noticing. Um, we are located in four offices. The uh, first one and biggest one is in Chicago, and we also have offices in New York, San Francisco, and in Paris. And we do work that is um, across many different scales and typologies in terms of our architectural projects that uh, includes high rises, it, it, it includes um, cultural projects, academic projects, and also um, a lot of adaptive reuse projects. We also have an urbanism and civic impact um, um, studio within, um, within our office that is focusing on uh, framework plans, master plans, park project, etc. And we also work on the opposite, kind of opposite end of the scale, the much smaller scale of interiors work. And I wanted to just um, very briefly talk about a few of our timber projects. And I'm starting with some smaller ones, but um, Javier, you had mentioned that we uh, want to talk today a little bit about the um, amazing opportunities that timber construction offers us also as a kind of way of to think about the design of projects. And um, something that I personally find incredibly exciting is how versatile timber is. So it can be used in, in, in so many different ways. And I just wanted to point out a few of them um, as a starting point here. So that is the Arctic Center of Social Justice. And there, timber is used um, very much like masonry. So it is um, stacked in a wall, just like brick, Bricks would be stacked, um, held together uh, in a mortar matrix. So it's kind of in, in its um, compression kind of um, additive stacked form. Um, the opposite of that is um, the, the uh, Writers Theater, close to Chicago here in Blanco, where timber was used really in um, its opposite structural capacity, which is in tension. So here, the balcony was actually hung um, from the, the Roof structure, which is also a timber structure, and therefore, uh, timber uh, is that how, how many different, different the, the variety can, can be used. Then. Now I'm getting getting back there, by the way. way. But, but anyway, anyway, I'll just I'll keep, talking. keep talking. And so and here it was, was like masonry, kind, kind of in its compressive form, form. while, while at the writer's theater, theater project, it was used as a um, tension element. So here the uh, balcony of the building was hung from the roof structure, which is also a timber structure. And so therefore the uh, timber elements could be very thin and um, very almost like a screen, like an ephemeral screen. 
Um, and so the, the uh, way of the, uh, the connect connections are devised and the way the whole structure is devised is very much related to its structural capacity. Though today we also, of course, want to talk about how timber can be used when we envision our future cities. And so that also includes some uh, construction methodologies that are repeatable and can be uh, can lend themselves to a speedier construction. So here in the Cresby College project, we use timber in, in, in many different ways, in the cladding, for example, on the facade here, but also on the interior in terms of um, glue lamp beams, which is probably a quite uh, common method that um, we are all familiar with. So here the uh, uh, timber is used also in prefabricated wall panels, which of course makes the um, speed, enhances the speed of construction and offers um, that kind of uh, faster method of building. And then finally, um, the last project I wanted to share was the is the uh, Harbor Treehouse project. And I think this one is interesting because very much you can see in the design the inspiration of the material going back all the way to really how where timber comes from and how trees are structured. So here the building um, is, is very much kind of um, the structure is bundled at the base, kind of creating these larger openings and kind of splaying out at the top becoming uh, much more ephemeral. And that structural um, idea was also then developed into the overall building structure together with Arab engineers where very much the kind of um, bundling and tree um, inspiration is still uh, very much apparent in the project. So, all right, with that I'll hand it over. Good luck. I'm not sure how to handle this because I'm also taller, louder, and so... <laughs> We'll see how this goes. Uh, well, thanks everyone for coming. My name is Benjamin Johnson. I'm a structural engineering principal uh, with SOM here in Chicago. And I've been with the firm for 16 years and I've become a bit of a timber guy, uh, helping out on projects throughout the firm, uh, being kind of the, the go-to person as a technical expert. And so it's a, you know, a, a couple of projects um, that I've worked on along the way. And I think they really showcase the power of timber and what timber can do that other materials cannot. So at SOM, being an integrated design practice, we have architects, engineers, uh, and we come together to create buildings and we try to strive for structural clarity and, and honesty in the approach um, that we have. Okay. Um, what we try to do is have that, that honesty and that expression of the, uh, of the structural system uh, in the design, and I'll talk about a couple of projects and where we see this um, moving in the, in the future. So starting with the Billie Jean King uh, Library in Long Beach, this project was a redevelopment of an old parkland associated with the old library. And the goal of the project was to build this new library on an existing garage, when all you had in place at the time was three foot of soil. So to build this building on this existing garage and reuse those foundations, we essentially swapped three feet of soil for two and a half stories of building. And to be able to do that, it has to be very, very lightweight, and it has to have minimal loads down onto the foundation. And so as we studied various components and materials, mass timber was the clear winner because it can be lighter than any other building uh, framing system. And we took a kit of parts approach throughout the entire building uh, with replicated uh, elements uh, throughout. And so by doing that, we were able to reuse that existing garage uh, and, and enhance the uh, sustainability of the project by not having to uh, rebuild the foundations. And so this is the, uh, the inside of the, uh, the library, taking a look at that, that central atrium. And what we found through the analysis is that, yes, timber is oftentimes the lightest material, but there's issues around seismicity, um, and other load-bearing components where we found that a hybrid approach with using structural steel for the uh, columns and lateral load-resisting system would actually result in an overall lighter footprint than just the timber building uh, itself. We also had to match the existing column grid of the parking structure, and so instead of using a thick five-ply cross-laminated timber, we ended up using uh, uh, glue lamp joists at a tight spacing with a plywood diaphragm, uh, which is really unbeatable in terms of the weight. 
And then instead of trying to, yeah, instead of trying to um, conceal this hybrid structure, it's really celebrated where you see the, uh, the structural steel bracing uh, that's coming through at the uh, lower level um, that allows the, the overall project to be uh, accept, a success. Now, moving on from that project, I'd like to talk about the uh, San Mateo County Office Building 3. Now, for this project, it's located um, just a few miles from the uh, San Andreas fault line, so incredibly high seismic forces. And so that same principle kind of approaches, how do you minimize seismic forces? Well, one is with a really ductile lateral load resisting system, again, using steel bracing, buckling restraint braces, but then pairing that with the lightest timber building uh, that you can really do uh, to minimize those, those demands. And so this is a zoom in on, on the structure. You can see the buckling restraint braces uh, beyond. And so this is more of a conventional style timber building where we have a five ply cross laminated timber uh, deck with a non-structural concrete topping slab, which I'll talk about in, in a little bit. But this is reminiscent of a lot of timber construction that's happening out there, a 20 foot grid uh, based on the shipping of, of the CLT uh, and those limitations. But what we like to do is to say, let's make sure timber's at the forefront of space planning and usability. I really recoil when I see timber buildings with very tight column grids because those are good candidates for replacement uh, well before their natural service life. And so this project, we ended up using uh, conventional blue lamb, conventional CLT deck, but we detailed it in a way with continuous blue lamb joists to achieve a 35 foot uh, clear span, uh, leaf span around the perimeter. Um, that's really consistent with, uh, with temporary uh, building uh, usage. And then you can see all of the steel in the, the, ply, or the CLT diaphragm to make that, that seismic uh, system work. So it's a good building. It's, it's kind of the top of the end of, of what you would see with a traditional timber building. But thinking about cities in the future and how we take this further, we have to think and ask ourselves, how can we use actually less timber? Because I'm a firm believer that we use way too much timber in our current mass timber buildings. And so beyond just the, uh, the work that we do with building design, SOM is very engaged with research, innovation, and testing. These are some photos of some tests that we did back in 2016 at Oregon State University where instead of using a non-structural concrete topping slab, we put a very thin structural topping slab that allows that five ply CLT to span instead of 20 feet, 25, 30 feet, uh, depending on the other particulars. And we learned a lot about this testing program and we've kind of continued uh, forward uh, to today where we're looking at some, uh, some new uh, types of timber concrete composite uh, connectors. So I like this photo because you can't really see what's going on. There's some very secret connectors between the concrete uh, slab and the CLT below. Um, but by embracing this technology, we can actually use three-ply cross-laminated timber everywhere we would be using five-ply cross-laminated timber to date, which would allow us to build 30% more timber buildings for the same uh, forest uh, uh, resource uh, consumption that we have on conventional technology today. So we really see that as a future timber for everyone. Okay. <clears throat> Can you hear me all right? Good. Hope that this goes no more changes, hopefully. Um, so I'm Carlos Cerezo, I'm Director for Sustainability at KPF Architects, and I am probably the least uh, involved all the time in Timber of this crowd with the least experience, um, but I run our environmental performance team. So looking more at how do we quantify these things in our projects. And I'm gonna talk about one project in particular, which is for us the most important hybrid high rise that has evolved the most in the firm. But when I was preparing these slides, I was trying to think a little bit about where our projects are and why, how we, how, what, why it has taken us a while to jump into timber in the large size of the work. And it has to do a lot with working in parts in the world where it's tougher, but then also most of our production is commercial buildings, very, li very large scale, very urban mixed use projects. So up to very recently, it has been relatively complicated. But hybrid timber has been the, the piece that sort of, as it's become more accepted, has opened the door for us to do a lot of things. So there are a number of projects on the boards. The one I'm talking about today is Rural Exchange, which is a project in Vancouver, in Bental Center. Before jumping into the project and kind of extending into that point of the global footprint, what I think has become interesting as we think through the, through the projects 
and to a point that Benton just made is that it's not only about is timber good and can we do timber, but should we do timber depending on where we are. So I wanted to bring in comparison. This is another project that we were doing in Singapore, which started exactly at the same time, same very high aspirations from a client from a sustainability perspective, same height, same core and shell, but where the client came to us asking for CLT because they had seen it in other hybrid projects in Singapore. And in this case, we told them not to go for it because you don't have a regional forestry industry around Singapore. It's really hard to bring things there. There are the transportation carbon emissions associated with it. And on top of that, there's a whole other set of bio-based and low carbon materials that need to grow as an industry in that part of the world if we wanna get to these very decarbonized built environments that are not CLT panels that come from Austria. So this question comes up, right? And you have to kind of educate yourself first and then educate your design team so that they know what to advise the client. But going to the place where it makes a lot of sense, so this is where our exchange is a high-rise 16-story building in Vancouver. Um, it's in fairly advanced in its development and it's a hybrid timber solution. And it's, it's an insert in an existing park of office towers, Pentel Center, which is from the 60s and 70s, part of a larger stitching project. This is the only building that comes in. And the interesting thing as well, and where it would add value to it in addition to its environmental uh, values and carbon sequestration and so on, is that it's built uh, um, on top of a tunnel, effectively. So anything that reduced load and therefore reduced the size of foundation was really important for the project. So this is the building, it sort of architecturally tries to breach the scale between those 60s very glassy towers and the new public realm that we are developing as part of the master plan. Um, but the reason why it makes sense is because it's here, right? So not only is timber and forestry in British Columbia part of the history of uh, that part of Canada and an important part of the economy and you have manufacturers close by, is that on top of that we found out as we were working in the project that the trade that installs the CLT for you also does a, a precast concrete. And that's great because as a synergy, everything is prefabricated. You can expect the concrete to really, really low carbon. And now you're saving the client time, you're saving the client money. And we sort of managed to convince them to do not a full timber top of the tower, which is what we originally wanted to do, but this hybrid solution with precast columns and full timber slabs. And the result of the spaces that we hope we'll end up with are these, which they got fall in love with. That makes everything much easier and that are really compatible both in terms of spans and in character with what tenants are gonna be looking in this type of spaces. We, I think we have 30 feet spans, which are not as long as we would in other buildings, but they are fairly decent across the board. And then all of the lateral loads are done through a concrete, uh, which is the only kind of non-flammable key part of the building. And that gave us some space to, the innovation part that is happening now as we develop the project to look at, okay, how do we now play with details? How do we hide the MEP we're doing this double layered system between purlins or girders where we can hide ducts and, and electrics and so on above. So you can see the main beams, but the tenants still have the freedom to do whatever they want with the space. And that has been successful both on the environmental side. So this is in-house LCA roughly compared to the post-stress concrete solution, which was the baseline for the project around a 40% reduction in both weight and carbon. But also the, the real win here is that the, the client fell in love with it enough that now timber slowly creeps into other parts of the project, right? So now as they want it in ceilings and can we do this amenity space differently? Can we do the facade differently? So it unlocks an opportunity to save carbon across the board, not only in the structure. Um, and that's it. I'm gonna pass it to Craig for his speech. Thank you, Carlos. Hi there, my name is Craig Applegath. I'm a Canadian architect. Although I feel like I'm coming home tonight because, am I not close enough? When I was a student, I did a, my graduate degree in Boston and in between the two years I was there, I came and worked for SOM. So I love Chicago, it's a great city. It's, I think it's the center of architecture in the United States. But anyway, um, what I get to talk about tonight is the future of what I think, what we think in dialogue is the future of mass timber. You've got a sense of what the present is, you've got a sense of how the structure works, you've got a sense of how sustainability works, and I think you've probably got, you'll cover everything. He's gonna sum it all up and take it home. Okay, so, so we've gotta go onto my slide. There we go. 
Oh, okay. Okay, so I'm a partner, founding partner at Dialog. Uh, we're a practice of integrated designers, architects, engineers, planners. We've got a studio in San Francisco, Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary, Toronto, very heavily Canadian based. And we're passionate about um, making a difference in the world. That's why we're a B Corp. Um, and part of that passion is sustainability. Um, and uh, the, the teams that I work with, this is one of my teams here, we get really, really jazzed when we get to do work that is not only cool architecture, but moves a needle. Um, and this project that I'm showing you tonight, really briefly, because I got five minutes, is what we think is the future of mass timber. It's low carbon hybridized mass timber structure in tall buildings, super tall buildings. And um, this is a, a very famous quote that I like to use by uh, Greta Thunberg. And it's really clear that we're in existential um, climate emergency right now. I know that half your country doesn't believe that, um, but it's true. Uh, and we are trying our very best as a practice, a little architecture engineering planning um, practice of only 600 people to try and figure out how we can make a difference. I mean, every day you turn on the news and there's some climate disaster happening somewhere around the world, whether it's fires in Quebec or in, of all places, Hawaii, or floods in Europe, um, or South Asia, um, we asked ourselves, what can we do as a practice? What can we do as a practice to actually make a difference? And so one of the things we've been doing for the last 20 years is focusing on how we can use mass timber um, as a way to pull back on climate, um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, because the embodied carbon in mass timber is anywhere between 14 and 25% less than steel and concrete. And the range is there because mass timber comes from different places. Um, and so here, I'm just gonna run through really quickly some of the projects at UBC. This is a project we worked on 10 years ago. It's the first living building challenge, all seven petals in Canada, second one uh, um, outside the United States, uh, produces all of its own energy, mass timber. This is one that's also down in the exhibition below, uh, 2150 Keith Drive. It's a, it, what's that mean? <laughs> Doesn't mean anything. <laughs> okay, um, it, it's, a, it's a commercial office building, all mass timber. This is a building that my team did. Um, it's a six story, indigenously inspired, zero carbon um, mass timber building for a post-secondary institution, a college. And it's gorgeous. And it's just so beautiful to walk through. I was walking through the, the other day at the opening. But um, in 2018, as a practice, the partners got together at one of our um, offsites, and we said, what do we, what, what do we do about the future? How can we really understand how mass timber can apply in the future? And we realized that all the buildings being done in mass timber were being done in low and medium rise buildings, like somewhere between six and you know, 20 stories. Well, look at your city. How many of the, those kind of buildings are in the city? Not many, they're high rises. So how do we get mass timber into high rises. So we asked the question, how can we design a mixed use high rise building using wood, steel, concrete, and other advanced materials that maximize the overall use of sustainably harvest wood by volume? This is the key thing. How do we get mass timber into buildings? Not because it's pretty, not because clients want it, they do by the way, but because it stores carbon, biogenic storage of carbon as well as reduction in body carbon. So this is what we came up with and it's too long a story to tell in five minutes, but it's 105 story hybridized mass timber building. So hybridization means it's a tube um, structure, it's got a concrete core, it's got a steel diagram on the outside, and did you know that 70% of building materials are tied up in the floor system? 70% in tall buildings. That's what we did. We made the building have a CLT floor system. That's how you lock up all that carbon in a tall building. However, Realtors um, want a 40 foot span and mass timber doesn't span that. So we came up with a hybridized floor panel, a 10 by 40 panel that's got two post tension cables in it that actually allow us to span that distance. So this, and by the way, this is a patent structure. We invested somewhere around half a million dollars to figure out how to do it over a couple of years. And this is the value proposition right here. There's the one on the, what is it there, um, right? is a, a typical mass timber system where you've got about 20 to 30 feet at most, and then you've got 40 feet for the hybridized system. 
This is not just paper architecture, folks. This is actually being right now tested. We're building the floor plates. We've built the full floor plate in our testing. We're bending it, creeping it, um, shearing, testing, and burning it. Um, and so um, we're not the only ones that think this is cool. Uh, we got a call a couple years ago from Fast Company of all places saying, your um, idea has won the most innovative idea of 2021. That's very cool. So if you want to check it out, um, there's more information about it down in the exhibition. There you go. Five minutes? Five minutes, okay. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. I'm very sick. So, my name is uh, Christian Lars Elmark uh, from Copenhagen, Denmark. Um, I'm here to talk about acoustics, uh, which is definitely a problem. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm also an architect working with timber, as well as I'm working with many other materials. Like we, we, we're trying to work more and more with it, with it and, and a lot of it has also been like trying to educate our clients. And when you asked me before, I, I was actually not joking. I did kind of like try to wrap this up. We were told like only to bring like a few slides. So obviously I packed each slide with lots of imagery to stick within the five slides. So it's a little bit cheating, but to talk a little bit about like sort of past, present, future. So we did none of these buildings, but I thought I'd like bring them anyway. Um, it was, it, I mean, it's just sometimes also when we when we introduce the idea of working with timber to clients, you know, and it's always like it's we talk about this being new and innovative, but you know, basically it's the one material that ties pretty much all countries together. The first materials we start working with, and we can actually see like I mean, the first building you see over there, this is in Copenhagen, right? You know, it, it, we we call it brick building, but actually the brick is merely keeping out the rainwater, like all the structure is timber. All the structure is timber. When you walk in, it still smells as good as it did like 300 years ago when it was built. Whereas like some of the later developments we have in the city, they, I mean, they just finished the last building plot. And at the same time, it's, it's very good for the economy. They can start renovating like the first one where they began 10 years ago. And sort of that cycle of like conventional building technology is maybe not uh, as good as, as we think it is. But for us as a studio, I mean, as I said, uh, we are from Copenhagen, Denmark. We are roughly around 100, 120 architects, technologists, designers, but also like computational designers that work on like computer software models that can support some of our design ideas, also anthropologists, business development, etc. So sort of a very diverse uh, team. Uh, we have two studios in, in Denmark, one in Copenhagen, one in Aarhus, and then we have a, a Shanghai studio uh, which is uh, roughly occupying uh, 40 people. And then we're also part of, uh, of Perkins Will here in the US, which obviously is a big global design company that allows us also to reach out and pull upon their expertise also when it comes to, to, to timber construction. So timber within, I mean, it's always been a part of our, our studio. I just like, these are, these are a few projects that are all like more than 20 years old. So we always been interested in working with, with timber. One might say that a lot of these projects here are sort of maybe built a bit more out of contextual or even like vernacular reasoning, if you will, like where each, I mean, we have a tendency to look at each project, each side, and then see what inspires us, but also what was already there and what kind of building mythology, what kind of resources can we draw upon. Um, roughly 70% of our work are done outside Scandinavia, so we need to be very sort of cultural resilient, like to bring in or create resonance, really to, to, to bring that in cultural resonance between us and the places we're working. So, I mean, this is a hunting cabin, it's actually an, an airport, and then this is a uh, business center we did for the world's largest uh, wooden ship. So that's actually like been in water for like more than a thousand years, and it's, it's, it's still in pretty good shape. So that's sort of like, maybe we can also do a bit of myth busting today, talking about like timber and its capabilities. And, but at one point, like we wanted to see how to push like working with timber maybe into a more commercial area. Uh, at that time, this is maybe 15 years ago. It wasn't really not even in Scandinavia thing. Like, I mean, timber was more like a, for single family housing, summer houses, etc. So with a group of clients, we sort of came up with the idea of creating like this flexible system. It's called the frame house, what you see to the left. We kind of mapped around Copenhagen and found the place that had the most single or two people companies. And then we did this like low rise, three floors, flexible. It's called frame house because it's all done like the same structure you would see in barn houses. It can be like 
adapted like in, in, in both directions with, with the frames and then all connected. So it's like Gulam and CPT structures. And the small image up there is actually for, it's a, it's a secret project for, for the Lego family, but we like, can see it there anyway. And they were also like, I mean, Lego, you all know the brick, but you know, it's basically made of plastic and the plastic is like, comes from, from oil, right? So they're also trying to figure out how are they going to do their bricks in the future. So when they asked us to look upon a new headquarters, said like, maybe that could become part of the narrative. And we sort of introduced the idea of working with, with Tipper uh, and, and they bought into it and just creates like this, this fantastic space. So next year, oh, that was one slide too many. Uh, just some of the, the projects that we're working on right now, like larger office buildings. So these are obviously all visuals because they're like on the way, but it's interesting. They're all narrative. This is from actually, well, it's, it's, not, it's, it's close to where you show the project. This is from the University of British Columbia, the UBC Gateway, a project we're working with the Perkins and Wilson Cooper Studio. And then a, a project we actually just won recently in Norway for an office building. And then a life science building where we're actually trying to see if we can use timber also as part of, of lab building. And then looking a little bit into the future, uh, we talked about, you, you already talked about tall buildings. So we, we won a competition a few years ago in Switzerland where we are constructing like the world's tallest uh, timber building for residential, which is going to be also the core uh, as, a, as a timber frame system. So the height in itself is maybe not that interesting. I mean, the thing about, you know that as well as any other city like Chicago used to have the tallest building. Now they don't anymore. There will always be somebody like with a taller building. However, what was interesting for us with this was to actually see like how we could use timber and try even more aggressively, if you will, to challenge the more like conventional industry, which means we need to be smart when we talk about prefabrication, off-site manufacturing, and doing something that can actually challenge concrete when we talk about tallness. So, I mean, I won't go too much into the detail about the system here, but again, it's, it's a hybrid system where we, we marry sort of the benefits of different materials. So it's, it's, it's concrete, it's a tube and tube system that goes in the tall building. So basically how we used to build with two tubes that are connected by floors, but here to minimize the size of the floor, we also put a little bit of high tension concrete, you know, so we use sort of the, the pressure and tension uh, capabilities of timber and wood on the slabs tie the two cores together. Also like it comes much more fire resistance, much better acoustics, acoustically, yeah, there was the acoustics. And then obviously also lowers the height so we get much more daylight into the building. So because we are like one of the biggest challenges is, is the densification and urbanization of our cities, being able to go tall, which I'm normally not a, necessarily a fan of going tall for the sake of going tall, but here actually this could be a viable way. And, and then lastly, a few projects where I really see us like moving right now is using the lightweight capabilities of timber. Because like we have so many buildings that are being knocked down and building new, but we could actually buy, I mean, when we talk about, you know, almost like seeing transformation as surgery, and sometimes we need like some sort of extension. So these are two projects we're working on right now. One in Oslo, where the client well, actually want to knock down the building and do two high rise, but we came with a su suggestion of actually keeping and building timber on top. And the other one that's uh, on exhibition down there is a project we're working on on Toronto, where these listed silos were like not to be touched, but the idea of actually sort of enhancing the integrity, as we said, of the silo by working with sort of a yin yang strategy, heavy, light, uh, closed, open, concave, convex, and then obviously concrete and timber, which sort of created like this strange marriage between the two components, and hopefully that will sort of become the new cathedral of the, the, the waterfront in Toronto, let's see. All right, thank you. I've been told that we really need to speak like this. Okay, so you did well, Christian, really close. Um, can you hear me? No? Okay, so then I, I, I don't know what to do, honestly. Um, I'll do my best. I'll, I'll... Listen, amazing projects, reflections, experiences. It, it's, it's in just, honestly, in 30 minutes, you've taken us to so many different exercises, very different situations. I promised at the beginning that 
one thing I wanted to talk about is, you know, kind of the backstage that the designers, the team tell us uh, a bit of what's happening behind. Because I think we all know why. Uh, why timber is now not a trend, it's probably a must. No? It's not a nice to have, it's a, even I think it's an obligation, no? Um, but um, when timber, when do you guys manage to convince a client that this building should be a timber building? Or is it your clients coming to you saying, I want this to be in timber? What is that process? I'm, uh, I'm sure there's not just one case or one example, but I'm, you know, in all this, uh, you know, the, the, the buildings and projects that you just described, uh, I can see that they're very different situations, but the result is always timber, no? What is the base for that success? What is the base for this evolution, you know, from other materials to timber? And if you could give us that, you know, kind of backstage uh, knowledge, any one of you or all of you, um, Christian. Does this? It works? Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, we do all of the things you mentioned. Like sometimes it's client that, I mean, for this particular project, uh, the client actually spent, which was made it super interesting for us. They kind of did their due diligence because this is like, you know, a technical moon landing, like to try to go 100 meters tall in a timber building with no concrete core. So they spent the best of four years in advance in collaboration with Val Gamorini Engineering. It's important to mention the ETH Zurich, the Technical University, and investors actually to, to develop the system, like to test it and so they were sure, because we also see a lot of projects that want to go taller, do this, do that, and then once like they like get to the goal line, you know, they're, they're not ready to go. So here there was an international competition where we actually were told you need to use the system. We want to use you architects to explore how this particular tube and tube system could actually become a beautiful tall building. And then one might think, you know, uh, that wearing such a, uh, like a strange jacket, like we had a system, we had a site, there was already a zoning plan that depicted that it needed to be like a sort of a perimeter donut building with a tower into it. And you ask like eight studios, um, what the result might be. And this is obviously where it's, it's nice that, you know, architectural vanity comes into play. Like some studios were like, really wanted like to express their own emotions, if you will. But the thing with timber obviously is like, you know, this is not working with the concrete. Like it, you kind of need to stay within the field of options that timber allows you. Like it might seem as a strange act, but once you sort of learn to work with it, like then it becomes really interesting. Like, so, our solution actually became more a celebration, if you will, of the system, like then working more with the unit size system on the facade, that could, like, because suddenly like we are moving backwards, like everything here in concrete is obviously a um, curtain wall system, you know, it's kind of like the, the cradle of curtain wall, and now we're going backwards in this typology to a load bearing facade, like so for us, we didn't want to hide that, we wanted to celebrate like the heaviness and the strength of the building, like the post-industrial structures you would find on the site, but we wanted to slim it down and then kind of like working with like that. So, well, that was a long answer to a short question on, on a client like coming with the system. But most time it's something we propose. Sometimes we also propose it as an alternative, saying we can do it like this and we can do it like that. And then through also using computational design, we kind of try to showcase that it was, will actually not be more difficult, more expensive, like more, definitely not more polluting. And, in the end, obviously, what drives this right now is legislation. So, like politicians, like who has the capability it's, to look more interesting than four now, years ahead. It's interesting now. I'm, I'm talking, speaking with the CWH hat on how, like, it has happened in the past with tall timber. Sorry, with tall buildings uh, in steel, in concrete, in history. Now it's kind of a race, you know, to what is the tallest, you know, in timber. You know? um, it's interesting, like, again, like the story repeats itself uh, because timber is the way to go. You know? And even, well, not only clients, but, you know, politicians, and public. Uh, Julian, tell us a little bit of... Uh, yeah, I was um, just about to chime in to say, and you were saying, of course, um, timber is the future, but also we already heard that it's not 
the future everywhere. It really depends what market you're working in and, and where you're at. And so maybe the way to answer that question is just to step back and um, why, why are we talking about timber? We're talking about timber because we as an industry have to reduce the embodied carbon of um, our buildings, right? So, and, and that can be done uh, by by various tools. It, it can be done by working on um, adapting an existing structure. That's that's maybe even um, better than, than building a new timber structure. So, But the point is there is this um, growing awareness of uh, the importance to reduce carbon if we uh, want to have a chance to reach the global warming um, or the prevention of um, more than um, 1.5 or 2 degrees of global warming. We have to reduce the carbon emissions. And, and um, of course, we, we have all shifted the conversation from um, having done a, a relatively decent job from reducing operational carbon to now really focusing on embodied carbon. And that conversation is really um, that's the, the core, and that, that timber can be one of the answers, And but in, in certain places where there is no timber industry, it might not be the answer, as um, you were pointing out. There's, if you have to ship it in halfway across the world, that might not be the answer. But um, in terms of how how do you have the conversation with clients? What we try to do is really to have the conversation about measuring the embodied carbon first and foremost, and then timber becomes very quickly part of the conversation. And it really depends on where that conversation is taking place. So for example, in um, Paris, where we have an office as well, the um, code restrictions are much, much tighter to where um, embodied carbon is on everyone's mind, and especially the developers' minds, because you can't get um, a permit approval if you don't prove a certain um, uh, kind of um, reduction of embodied carbon. So my, I guess to make that long answer really short, it, the conversation really is less so about timber, but it's about carbon. And when you start with carbon, and then often timber is the right solution, and that's where it enters the conversation, if that makes sense. Thank you, Carlos. Yeah, and I think that that is where we mostly get it from clients. I think that's a really important point, right? Because, well, there all cases are impossible, right? Sometimes there's a client that is really educated, like you were saying, and they've had experience before, and they come with a plan and they tell you, no, 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 this is a timber project. We know it already. You just have to figure out how to do it. Or we propose it, and what for me has been really interesting is that it really forces more than other aspects of buildings a lot of integration with, with experts, right? So every good timber project out there, there is testing, somebody has had to partner with like a manufacturer directly, with a structural engineer directly. So you cannot do business as usual. You really have to, if you wanna propose it to a client, you need to build that experience and that collaboration with somebody else. To the point that sometimes we'll try with a client with a structural engineer and a, you know, a contractor and then it doesn't work out. And then you partner with the same people the next time and it doesn't work out and then the third time, you figure it out, right? So that's how we propose it. But the point of carbon is interesting because the projects where you have those questions of is this right or not for this particular location is because now we're getting a lot of, especially commercial clients that have large commitments, right? Like ESG, we're gonna be carbon neutral by some date and they need something to show. And timber is so attractive because it's something that addresses a key part of the puzzle and you can see it in a building. So they, for them, it's perfect, right? It's like PV panels. Like everybody understands, oh, that's a good building, that's a good thing, therefore we're addressing our target. And I think we have as the building industry to really educate ourselves on the nuances so that we can really advise our clients on what to do. I think that um, it's really interesting where you work. I was bringing the, the question of Singapore before, but there's a researcher in, um, I think, University of Oregon, Jay Earhart, that has done a lot of research on the, the kind of global balance and like demand and availability of timber and so on. And it's not that you know, we're going to run out of timber anytime soon, but most of the production is concentrated on the northern hemisphere, right? Where it's not where most of the growth in cities is happening right now. So there is a question there of if the ultimate goal is reducing carbon, timber, yes, but also looking at what are the other things that we might, it might be more reasonable for that location and might also have to do with sequestering carbon and capturing carbon in buildings and so on. And well, I, 
I try to dig more in this um, backstage, you know, how, how companies like SOM, like KPF, like uh, are getting ready. How do you guys, this, this is not an easy process now. Most of you were not taught um, on timber, you know, when you went to your either architecture or engineering degrees. How this acquisition of expertise and then spread the knowledge, how are the teams getting ready to sound convincing, to learn about those nuances that you were, how, how is that process happening um, in your firms? Yeah, so I'll, I'll jump in there because I guess I would be in that same kind of um, category. I didn't have any mass timber design courses in school. and <laughs> I didn't have any, um, you know, mass timber, um, you know, mentors when I really first started uh, working. There might be a one-off project uh, here or there. And so I think a lot of the effort that's been done in the mass timber industry has been through grit and hard work because people want to do the right thing. People in the design professions want to embrace sustainability. They want to reduce the embodied carbon footprint um, of their buildings. Speaking as a structural engineer, oftentimes I was feeling kind of left out perhaps, you know, in, in the discussions around sustainability because I'm not trying to get water harvesting or PV panels or, you know, it's like we talk about thermal mass and recycled concrete or recycled steel and that was kind of it. And so as a structural engineer, mass timber is one of the things that can really have a disproportionate impact on, on your carbon footprint um, as, a, as a practitioner. And so you, you've asked the question on, on how do you get ready? Well, you've seen this, you know, absolute boom of, of interest in, in mass timber and, and there's so many great organizations out there uh, that put on, on events, uh, organizations like Woodworks, organizations like CTPUH and, and CAC, um, getting out there and, and, and educating uh, the public and, and uh, practitioners alike. And I think that's, that's really important. But the thing that's driving it is the desire and the need for more sustainable construction and people really want to achieve that goal. And so they go the extra mile to teach themselves timber. And it kind of just happens organically in terms of getting yourself ready. When people want to do timber, they just dig in and they get it done. Okay, but I, I think it cannot be that organic when you try to do a more than 100 story high prototype crate from coming from more standard projects. How did you guys, you know, execute that kind of vision? Well, I, as I was sitting here listening to the others, um, I think the question is a very important one, and it will very much um, be determined by the culture of the city and the country um, in which you're asking. Uh, I know that in Toronto, where I'm from, there is a very organic uh, culture of um, interest in mass timber for the last 10 years or so. And I was just thinking the best analogy is like mushrooms. Um, uh, mushrooms pop up in the rain and you see them, but really the mushroom is just a little piece of this huge mycelium that's going on in the ground. And I think that mycelium is what's been happening for the last 10 or 20 years of people getting interested in mass timber and coming together. The Wood Council has been promoting it here, the Canadian Wood Council. Um, there are a few guiding lights around the world that people follow. Um, and I think that's been happening quietly. And then what's happened in the last five years is the climate emergency where we're starting, everyone's starting to take it more seriously. And the potential for locking up carbon in, in wood, like one cubic meter, okay, one yard by one yard by one yard, um, locks up um, a ton of CO2. So, I mean, all of a sudden it's become more urgent. And I think that's the mushroom you see people all of a sudden starting to want it. All of my post-secondary higher education clients are demanding it. Um, developers in the United States and Canada are starting, the more forward-thinking ones like Heinz, are starting to ask it of their consultants. So I think it's, it's starting to build, but the, the young engineers I know coming out of school right now are looking for, for firms like SOM um, that are actually doing it and teaching it internally. So I think there's a, there's a natural magnet effect. So it's, it seems to be in sync with the demand. The supply is growing quite quickly. What do you find in Europe? No. Yes. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, we, we, we're seeing the same. No, I mean, that's a lot of things. Yeah. 
I don't know if I can keep it short, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to. So, so in the end, obviously, yeah, well, I don't know if it's obvious, but I mean, we, we can only, I mean, this is my learning, and I didn't learn about timber in school either, but then again, I'm, I mean, I went to an academy in Copenhagen, so I didn't learn about concrete either. We learned, learned about arts, right? You know, and then afterwards, I came to a studio, and then they taught me everything I needed to know about building. But, but then again, you know, this is like a, 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 a combined effort, so we always, like, try, like, to... Uh, to, to, to sit next to people that, that are smarter than yourself. Like, that's sort of the route to success as an architect, like, to, to do this together. But, but how do we get, like, to, to change the industry? Well, I mean, it starts with legislation, right? You know, so it's, it's a political issue. Like, if that's the way that you put pressure. Like, it, and, and that's happening. Like, that environment in Denmark now is, like, is so wild that we actually feel that, you know, our clients, like commercial developers, are ahead of us. They are the ones, like, when, if we want to work with them, they force us to, like, show us how we can get below eight. We want to go down to, like, 6.9, like, kilos of CO2 per square meter. Like, that's very little. I don't even really know how to get there, but we have ideas behind it. But that's how they want to invest, because they are smart and they can see if they don't start doing it now, they are like lost in a, in a near future. So, so the environment is, is definitely there. And as you were saying, also like we need to submit in order to, to, to get a building permit, you need like a full LCA analysis on your building. Like, but now clients are also trying to, 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 to push that, that, that even further. So, so it's an extremely like interesting time to be an architect in like, even though like people are saying that, you know, which is probably true that 80% of everything we need to build before 2050 has already been built. So there's not a lot of new buildings left for us to build. Let's just face that. And once you sort of have swallowed that pill, it's actually quite interesting. Like, you know, so, so right now, for instance, for me, what, I mean, the, the most interesting project I'm working on right now is like a, a shopping mall in Copenhagen. You know, something, you know, like trying to find uh, love in the common in the everyday, in the buildings already built, like that, it's not just about doing like iconic buildings that you know has like a particular shape and gets a lot of like clicks on Pinterest or whatever, but actually like trying to see like and, and a fall in love with like you know uh, I don't know what's what's it called or Kmart or whatever it's called like, but but you know these abandoned structures like in suburbia who are just standing there like if if. If you ask me, like, all buildings should be listed by default, and then only if you had a really, really, really good reason to take it down, you could be allowed. But, like, you need it sort of to be forced to work with all what's already there. And this is not just building. This is also, also like, urban, urban areas. Like, you know, that, that urban spaces are, are precious, right? You know, and so in our office, like, we don't want to do greenfield buildings. For instance, like, you know, it needs to be something that's already been, like, built on and then we'll look upon it. Like, the whole idea of just keep adding more and more and more is, like, is, is we came to the end of that. And again, just to round it up, that's, again, where timber is such a potent material because it is lightweight. It is soft, so you can actually manufacture it on site. You know, you can adopt it on site once you sort of get to the bones of a structure and you figure on it figure out it's completely different than what you thought, you know, you can, it's easier like to, to like to, to change than it is with like with the cast concrete element. You know, that's, that's pretty, pretty difficult. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take questions from the audience. Uh, I just have one last from here, uh, from me at least. Um, what's the biggest advantage? What's the one thing that you have been able to explore, to push with timber? that you would not be able to do with other materials? Uh, I think, you know, it was, it was mentioned earlier about a, a project and clients kind of getting, uh, you know, emotional about, about things. People love timber, okay? They just, they love it. And because of the sustainability around it, because of the warmth of it, uh, the natural beauty and all these things, like people want to be in them, they want to occupy them, you know, uh, biophilia is a real, a real thing. And so when you wrap all of those things and package it as, as a timber building, it really sells itself, it sell, sells itself um, because people get emotionally attached and wrapped up in them. And I think that's the most powerful thing is that when people want to do them, they'll do them. Fantastic. Carlos? I think from the biggest advantage for me in the work I do is that it opens the conversation. 
to everything that Julianne was saying earlier, right? Like, I don't know, like even five years ago, like sit down and talk to a commercial developer of office towers about embodied karma, good luck, right? Like you, you'll fight with them about concrete mixes and you'll fight with them about how much glass you should have in your building and you're fighting against a financial argument all the time. And there's no discussion. And Timber has this incredible power that it's something that they understand how it works, that is meaningful to them, that they understand the value at a lot of different levels, and you have one foot in the door, right? And then from there, I was like, well, you're doing this already. Like, you want to tell this story about your building to your potential clients, to your, you know, the city, so you can convince them. So why not also look at these or look at that? So it's a, it's an icebreaker for introducing sustainability in projects that, that when it wasn't as common or as known by the majority of the people that we work with, um, we didn't have. So that's, for me, that's the biggest advantage, right? Yeah. All of the above, but I think carbon, carbon, carbon. It's lower embodied carbon and it locks up carbon. Uh, and it does it in a way that people love. So if, if you don't meet resistance, that's carbon. So the, the question was the biggest advantage? Well, I think we, I mean, we already touched upon a lot of them, like more, at least. More like, you know, how timber allows you to do things that you could not yeah, do. Yeah, but I mean, and I think like, and, we, and like, you know, obviously this conversation could go on much longer. And we haven't even touched upon what we were just saying about, you know, sort of the more, you know, the, the tactile, emotional qualities of timber. Like, I mean, just, for a second, if I could like get all of you like just close your eyes, like and imagine this room, like these columns here would be like big laminated veneer lumber columns. You would have like CLT panels, like the, the facade would be a hybrid system of, of wood and aluminum, like and, and not only would and this is like proven, not only would your heart start beating slower, right? You know, you would feel better and we would also have way better acoustics. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any questions from the audience? Ladies first. Um, I'm very interested in the education of the younger people coming up in all of our countries worldwide to say, is there, you know, in the United States, we used to have shop class, and that no longer exists. It's coming back in some areas. Is there a way that your industry, for all the wonderful things you're doing, can you push that please down to the high schools and the grade schools? Because it's fascinating. And the kids will have an idea why they are recycling. We just got a really bad report about Chicago and 9.6% is all we do, if we really do that. So thank you for tonight. It was wonderful. But please help that younger group. That's it. I'll, um, I don't think that, well, thank you for that comment. I, I, um, maybe that wasn't so much as a, a question, but nonetheless, I think you're bringing up a really important point, which is, um, and it's something we started to talk about, how can we educate more about that topic? And I think that, yes, I agree. I think um, uh, uh, reaching out and, and playing a role in um, even bringing more people to the field of architecture, which um, of course means um, getting, getting to them before they choose um, what they want to do career-wise with their life. I do agree that that's very important because architecture still suffers from um, uh, there not being enough d diversity. So I think uh, getting um, pr or, or sharing <laughs> what uh, some of our knowledge with high school students and even younger can can help to make our field more diverse. And, and, and why am I bringing that up in the conversation of um, Timber is because I do think that there is an opportunity here to not just think about um, sustainability, but to also think about 
um, the broader context of, of health and equity within um, our built environment. And I do think, and, and our culture, frankly, but I do think that what's really um, exciting to me is that these conversations do start to overlap. And I think that is great that they do because there are, um, there are related, uh, those are related topics. And um, the, the fortunate thing is, getting back to your point about educating younger people is that they are demanding from us that we do address these uh, topics for them because it is um, not so much us. Um, actually, yesterday I was at an event and someone, I forgot which very smart person, came up with this quote to begin with, but it was about um, not having inherited this world from our elders, but borrowing it from the next generation. And, and I think there's something to it, and that generation is asking us to do better. So I, I think, yes, we, we have to um, reply to that with um, being more responsible, um, but also educating, and we have to be open to that dialogue. So I think, and that is happening, um, to your point, I think there is very healthy dialogue with the younger generation in, in order to answer to, to some of these calls. At least that's, that's our experience. Yeah, hi. Um, th this is very interesting. Um, and um, you've shown a lot of very incredible and interesting contemporary work. So my question is, what kind of analysis and um, studies have been completed to determine how uh, material, especially when it's exposed to the exterior, is going to age in terms of exposure to um, water, pests, ultraviolet light. Does it lose some of its structural capacity over time, like other materials, or not? Um, I, I, you know, this is such new territory. I'm not sure, I haven't read anything about, you know, other than the photo of the 300-year-old warehouse that's all timber-framed inside, it looks terrific. Um, that's all completely clad in you know, brick and, and or slate, limestone cladding, whatever it is, exterior materials that shield it. So how do we deal with those sorts of issues going forward? I'll take a step at that. Um, I see a lot of mass timber buildings where the designers have decided that it's so beautiful that they're gonna put it on the outside of the building. And that is totally wrong thing to do. Wood is not to be left outside, um, unless it's a living tree. Uh, wood is very, very soon attacked by bacteria and fungus and insects, um, unless it's loaded up with pesticides, which is not a cool thing to do. So if you're gonna use mass timber, you I would argue that you have to keep it enclosed in a place where water can't get at it. Um, there, there are probably some that would argue there are various sorts of stains and coverings that will help, but I would I advise all my clients to do it in such a way that it's interior, and then it will last for, as you showed with those, those Copenhagen buildings for hundreds and hundreds of years. Yeah, I, I will, I, I might challenge that. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I mean, it, it, it depends on the project, right? No, I also showed other projects where the, the timbers exposed, but it's also like one of the sort of the, I think, great sort of hoaxes of modernism is that, you know, buildings are not needed to be taken care of. We build them and then we leave them. Yeah. But you can also like, I mean, we see beautiful timber houses where, you know, you, are, you have to, I mean, I know this would be difficult in a high rise, but in a lower building that, you know, every fifth or 10 year, you go out and you treat the wood like, or, or it's charred wood, or it's made under pressure, or, or with linen, linen oil, you know, there's plenty of ways, or a coir tree, you know, treated with acid, where you can also expose tree, not the structure, I agree with that. I mean, the structure you sort of need to take care of, you need to keep that dry, but in a dry, ventilated environment, that kind of structure can like last and outlast uh, most uh, materials. F fair enough. If you're willing to take care of it, it's just that as an architect, you can't be sure that the people that inherit your buildings will take care of them. But, you know, structure definitely. Uh, we're about at time, so we'll just make, have one more question. One final question. Who will it be? 
Um, one of the things um, tonight that interests me is the hybridization, that's the key word. So we, we've seen from the precedents that you brought here, um, hybridization of a single system like CLT with, you know, with, uh, with concrete. Um, we can also see um, hybridization between, let's say, steel column and CLT and uh, mass timber uh, columns, uh, no, not columns, uh, beams. So I'm just curious in terms of like massing and uh, like the, the, the request for bigger span on the height of the building, do you see kind of a gradient of hybridization? Let's say, you can say like beyond certain span, we want, um, you know, we swap out the columns. Beyond certain span, we want, um, you know, uh, or beyond certain height, we want to have a tube within a tube system, that kind of um, idea, given kind of the prerequisite that we want to keep carbon um, footprint the lowest. Yeah, so I'll, I'll jump in there. I think that hybrid systems are applicable um, at any scale or proportion around because it's all about how the material is, is operating. Um, a good example here would be, you know, Willis Sears Tower, and it's, you know, one of the tallest steel buildings, uh, you know, in the world. It's got 33 pounds per square foot of, of structural steel in it, and it's got about 45 pounds per square foot of, of concrete slabs uh, in it uh, to give it the fire rating and all the rest of it. But, you know, that bundled tube structure with the 75 foot span trusses, if you didn't have a concrete slab to make that a T-beam structure, that 33 pounds per square foot of steel would go through the roof. It'd be 50, 60 more pounds per square foot if you were trying to design that as a bare steel structure. And so I think that it's, it's really important that we leave behind kind of like the romantic notion of an all timber building um, because other materials are not really held to that, that standard. Um, and, and it's, it's quite frankly like not a good one because we're over consuming timber on individual buildings. Um, by rejecting that. And so when you think about the structural steel industry using, you know, concrete filled metal deck, that's applicable for buildings of all scale size and, and, and shape. And so, um, you know, unfortunately in, in timber buildings to deal with the acoustics and, and fire spread from level to level, we're, we're pouring a lot of non-structural concrete over, over timber floors, which is, is really defeating uh, the, the purpose. And so I think that with the climate crisis, it's kind of important to kind of like, you know, cut that out and just get to the <laughs> get to the heart of what's really um, you know important. And I think that hybridization is is a really important one. And and it should be said that timber concrete composites were developed during World War II because of a shortage of other materials. <laughs> and they're trying to stretch the bucket and go farther. And so, you know, uh, climate crisis is a scale, you know, beyond even that um, uh, worldwide event. And so we should have a similar approach and um, feeling towards the consumption of materials, which is don't waste any, save some more, do more timber buildings by using hybrid construction. Yeah, and I think that the, sort of demystifying this idea of like the timber building, and it has to be all timber, and it's like this unique thing. No, it's another material, just like you said smartly, if it's the best solution, if it's lighter, if it's cheaper, you use less than use it. And if it doesn't work, then don't. But I think that um, that's a really important distinction, right? Because people obsess about it without realizing that all of the structures we end up optimizing to the very specific condition of the building anyways, and using everything needed, right? We've, we've been developing an option for a timber, uh, like very, high, very heavy biomedical lab building, which has a lot of um, firm, you know, like bi vibration requirements. And it's not necessarily the immediate thing that you think about, and most of the building is concrete anyways, but it has a place. You can put it in slab in certain locations, and you make it work and it's lighter and easier and the structure gets smaller. It's not a timber building. Like timber is not, not even the majority of the structural materials in the building, but it actually makes sense there and you can use it and you're making a meaningful difference. Yeah. Oh, and one Last thing, and that, that is Great. mass timber is not a religion. It's a building material. Yeah. <laughs> this tall, tall, all mass timber buildings, it's, it's not real. Like they're held together with steel on the joints. Like, there's no such thing as an all timber building. They're not held together with wood dowels. So let's, let's figure out the best way to incorporate mass timber into buildings. I, I like the religion analogy. Um, so I, I came from a religion of glass and from steel, and now, you know, um, and that's a 
different type of religion that you can jump from one to another. And that's a, that's a more flexible approach to the concept. So thank you very much. I can't believe it's been three panels, you know, we've spoken about um, possibilities, anxieties, testing, codes, um, well, creativity. And I think it's been a great cycle. Thanks to the Chicago Architecture Center.